Arjun and Vinta have already laid the ground so well that I have uh, to say much less than I needed and uh, uh, thought I would have to earlier. So first of all, I just want to congratulate you on this little event and also for all the work you're doing because I think the Internet Freedom Foundation is making some very important interventions uh, and also reminding citizens of our rights, which we often forget. So what, the things that they've told you already are suggesting now that we are in a new phase of capitalism. Just when you thought you'd got used to finance capitalism, now we actually have digital capitalism and it's a whole new different thing. I won't say entirely new and different, but certainly it's different in some significant ways. It's a new model of profitability where the consumers provide the data that become the source of private of profit. So when you are interacting on Facebook or tweeting something or getting into LinkedIn to find out about other people or whatever, you are revealing things about yourself. And it's those facts about yourself which become these, the data that then is now seen as the new oil, the source of profitability. It's this ability to know about you, 360 degrees, everything about you, who you meet, what you like, what you prefer to eat, where you go, what you work as, the kinds of books or other things you read, what you uh, search for on the internet, all of these things they know about you. And that enables a significant degree of control. So often people say, well, I don't mind giving data, I have nothing to hide, is what they think. And they also feel that, well, it's only because I get targeted advertising. But of course, we all know that we get targeted advertising, we're all getting it every day, but that's the least of the problems. That's the most benign use of this data. I think you've already heard from Arjun how this can be used electorally. You've heard from Vinda how this can be used to target dissenters. There are all kinds of uses to which it can be put for targeting other social groups, for influencing other kinds of democratic process, for preventing certain kinds of things from happening by influencing public opinion or social reactions and so on, for monitoring and surveillance by the government. And this, of course, is enormous. This is so significant that um, Brinda has talked about how already certain data of the Aadhaar have been released, but the kind of way in which you can use the monitoring of all your interactions, whether by telephone or through the internet or etc., for monitoring and surveillance by the government and specifically in order to control dissent. These are truly frightening. This is why Sojana Zuboff called this surveillance capitalism which is why it's strongly linked to authoritarian governments. It's strongly linked to governments that actually want to be able to uh, control citizens in every possible way. And what is more worrying is that this is now one of the most centralized sectors in the world. We have the emergence of huge, huge digital companies that are uh, not just vertically uh, very dominant, but they're also horizontally done, they're spreading across different areas of digitization and of e-commerce in different ways. And of course, that's another reason why many of them have to be in bed with the ruling powers, wherever they are, and therefore further the aims of the authoritarian governments. But it's also that these companies are able to avoid taxation even more than other multinationals, because everything is intangible. There are no tangible goods or no actual services. There's all intangibles. And therefore, the ability to shift around your profits to tax havens or to places, jurisdictions where you have to pay much lower tax, that is hugely enhanced, which is why the big four, the fangs, as they're called, they barely pay any taxes. And in Europe, for example, Google and Amazon make all their profits in the tiny little country of Ireland because they choose to concentrate their so-called intellectual property there. Similarly, all of these big digital companies pay very little taxes anywhere in the world. Facebook gets 12% of its revenue from India, maybe 2% of its profits are officially from India. And of course, the taxes on those are also not paid here because a lot of it is in the form of intellectual property. And so they shift the value to other jurisdictions which have lower tax. What's really also upsetting is that the pandemic has dramatically worsened all of these tendencies. The only companies that have truly and completely benefited from this entire humanitarian and catastrophe and disaster are digital companies. The richest men in the world, Jeff Bezos and others, have just doubled 
their assets over the last few months. Uh, uh, Amazon has gone to becoming a one tri two trillion company instead of a one trillion company in the space of these five months. Profitability has increased dramatically. And as I told you, these are profits that don't get taxed. So while the entire world is suffering and in chaos and in economic decline, there's one sector that's doing very well, thank you, and that's the digital sector. And that digital sector, because of its ability to control human beings, society, and governments, and to be in collaboration with governments, is also unlikely to be taxed according to the kinds of profits that it's made. This is why it's a true threat to democracy. And understanding this new digital capitalism means that we have to actually think of new ways of confronting it, new ways of dealing with it. We can't do it without recognizing that this is a whole new animal that we have to deal with. Thanks.